Great. So you can all hear me all right. Um, and I'm going to start, uh, share my presentation with you now. Okay, wonderful. So microplastics in food. My name is Hannah Horsfield. I am the programs educator at the BUEI, um, which means I run their classes and their camps and their different programs for all ages here at BUEI. Um, I'm passionate about the sustainability of Bermuda's marine ecosystems, such as seagrass meadows, coral reefs, the intertidal zone. Um, my current focus really is on highlighting the devastating impacts of marine plastic pollution. Um, I collect beach plastic on a regular and I return it into upcycled impactful art. Um, you can see the image here on the right. This was a, um, an event we did with through BUEI where everybody came to make a different sea creature. This is actually the Bermuda Seamount from the top sunlight zone, twilight zone down into the abyss, talking about how plastics has infiltrated all parts of the ocean. Um, my hope is that my work will encourage everyone in Bermuda to reduce their consumption of disposable items and join the fight for a healthier ocean. So I'm going to start um, before we dive into the depressing world of microplastics. Um, I think it's important that we get a good understanding of what plastic is and how it directly and indirectly affects the planet. So you might not remember a time without plastics, but they actually have not been around for very long in human history. It's only been about 60 years. Um, they were only, yeah, like being mass produced around the mid mid 1900s. I usually say 1960s is when it really started to pop off. Um, plastic comes from the Greek word plastikos, which means being capable of shaped or molded into anything. And plastic wasn't all bad, right? I mean, it's made a lot of changes on our earth, a good positive changes, um, giving safe drinking water. Well, safe. We're going to learn about that today. Safe plastic water bottles, um, bottled water around the world, and then the packaging goods being able to ship and so sort of things that don't get spoiled. And then also in the medical industry, I mean, having these plastic items um, has revolutionized um, sanitation and our medical stuff. So but what is plastic? So if we look at how it's made, it starts off um, from this item here, crude oil. So I'm going to start talking about crude oil first um, and then how we get to plastic. So crude oil is pumped from deep within the ground. So these are some oil rigs that can be pulled, extracted from either the land or from the ocean. Um, and you can see here in these hands, it is a very, very opaque black sludge. Um, if you ever come to my classroom here at BWI, I can show you a jar of it. I have the stuff that we burn. We actually burned crude oil in Belco, which we are one of the few countries that still does that, which is crazy. Um, so crude oil, how it is formed. So this is why crude oil is a, um, Fine, um, is a finite resource because we are running out of it. Um, so 300 to 400 million years ago is when crude oil started to be formed. So all the life that was swimming around in the ocean, the plants, so any any organic material, then um, decompose, it dies, it then layers at the bottom of the ocean and it layers and layers and layers up. And over millions and millions of years, you can imagine all that dead organic matter being squeezed into this into um, a fossil fuel. So as crude oil or trapped natural gas. So those two that we then dig into the ground and tap into. So when we're using crude oil, it's directly damaging the earth, one in the oil spills that can occur. Um, so you can see here, these guys cleaning up an oil spill on the shoreline. This is what it looks like from a satellite, um, huge spill. Um, and then also as we're air pollution. So we create the air pollution here out of cars, um, and then the factories that also produce plastic. Um, and so the effects of that are that the planet is warming, right? We're seeing this climate change. It's not a new subject. We're learning about it all over. Everybody's talking about it now. Um, so what's happening, you can imagine as we're burning these fossil fuels, it's basically putting a nice thick blanket of smoke around our earth, which is which the sun rays can't bounce through. And so it makes our earth warmer. That's in the simplest way that I can explain that to you. Um, but you can see here from this map, the last hundred years, how um, fast the earth is warming up. So if you think crude oil formed 300 million years, and it's taken us like 150 to use almost all of it. And what the ma major effects that that has caused on our planet here in Bermuda, we're seeing already bleaching from our corals. So the ocean reef health is pretty being affected. And then of course the big evil H word that I'm not gonna say, they also come and hit our island pretty severely. So it is a real issue for Bermuda as well. Um, we are not exempt from this um, global crisis. 
So back to plastic, you take that crude oil and crude oil is then heated up. And that's where you get then the different types of um, like different gases. And so you, if you heat up plastic, um, sorry, you heat up the crude oil and it's refined into ethane and propane. The ethane and propane are then treated with high heat in a process called cracking. This is how they convert it from a monomer such as ethylene and propylene. So the monomers ethylene and propylene are combined with a catalyst to create a polymer, which is basically this fluff right here. You can see that fluff looks like powdery laundry detergent. So you can compare the two pretty close. So that polymer is fed through an extruder and then it's melted into um, a long tube. So they feed it through a pipe and it comes out in like a long, like a spaghetti. And then that cools and then they cut it into these little plastic pellets here called nurdles. So nurdles are the raw material of plastic. This is what they look like. And nurdles are found all over Bermuda's beaches. So before they even become a plastic item, so if I'm a plastic manufacturer, I make plastic forks, I'm gonna order like thousands and thousands of nurdles, of shipments of nurdles and melt them down in my factory. And then I have my product. So this is the raw material. And I guarantee you, if you sit on any beach on this island and within a few minutes, you will have a handful of these tiny little nurdles. They are often like these different colors because they've been weathered and out in the sun for a while. Um, but of course they look like fish eggs. Oh, sorry, like fish eggs. So I have a case study I wanted to show you. It's super depressing, but I'm not going to dwell too much on the depressing today. Um, I just think it's really important that we understand that before nurdles become a plastic item, they are severely damaging the environment. Um, they pose as much threat to marine life as an oil spill, um, and they're still not classified as hazardous. So in 2021, we had the largest plastic spill in history. It was the Express Pearl. It unleashed a record of 1,680 metric tons of plastic pellets on the Sri Lanka coastline. I remember this um, that summer we I was, had camps when I got the news and it brought me to tears because these it damaged so much of the Sri Lanka coastline. You can see this is the ship that blew up. Um, but yeah, so pretty tragic and another reason why we should just do away with this material. So plastic goes from nurdles into seven different types. So when we were talking about the polymer, you could add different things to the nurdles to create a different hardness of plastic. It's like a simple way of understanding that. So if you look at any plastic item, it usually has this little um, recycle triangle on it with a number inside of it. And so there, this is what makes plastic difficult to recycle because you have seven different types that melt at different temperatures and they are shredded, they're different hardness. And so being able to take like plastic out of a landfill or even plastics out of the ocean that's broken into many pieces, it's difficult to decide what type they are and how to go about recycling them. Um, the ones that I wanted you to have a know about is that PPE Number one and number three are probably the most dangerous to our human health. Number one is the one that they actually make plastic water bottles out of. Um, it's polyethylene telephylate, tephylate thing. Sorry, I'm, I'm pretty bad with those. And then, so the PVC is also really bad. Now, I don't wanna dwell too much on this because I haven't done the real deep research because I find it extremely um, depressing, but if you think about PVC, it's really, it's been found in our human blood samples and it is, PVC is what our houses are all plumbed with. So the water goes through the PVC pipes and what the direct effects of that are, we don't know because it's also recent, but it's just another thing to be aware of that, oh my goodness, it really is all around us. Um, so how much plastic are we talking? Since the 1950s, we have produced 9 billion tons of plastic. So in 1950s, we manufactured 1.7 million tons of plastic in that year. We now manufacture over 400 million tons annually. The shipments alone made 600 billion US dollars in 2001, uh, I mean, 2021. And 1 million plastic bottles are bought every minute and five trillion plastic grocery bags are bought annually. So those are some of the really staggering numbers um, on how much plastic we're actually consuming. And here's a little example of what 8.3. So we're saying almost 9 billion, 
This study here is 8.3. This is actually an infographic from a while ago. Um, but just to give you an idea of what 8.3 metric tons are, that's 250,000 times the Empire State Building or 80 million times the blue whale. I mean, it's just staggering. If that helps you kind of understand a little bit more how almost 9 billion metric tons would look like. It's pretty scary. So, and every first, every, the very first pieces of plastic ever manufactured are still somewhere on this planet. I find that's a really important quote because then you're like, wait a minute, if a plastic water bottle lands in the ocean, it's gonna take 450 years for it to break down. We've only had plastic in the world for about 60 years. So thinking about that, everything that's either, I mean, here in Bermuda, it's either been burned in an incinerator or it's sitting somewhere in the environment, which is really um, scary. I find that, it, that, I find that scary. Okay, so talking about the ocean. So organisms can't naturally break down the chemical bonds in plastics. We know this, right? So every plastic item that isn't recycled merely breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. And over a course of its lifetime, it can turn right into the most minuscule, tiny pieces called nanoplastics. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about micro and nanoplastics that are infiltrating our food because that's what this whole month is about. And I'm really excited. Well, I'm not excited. I'm, I am excited. I'm, I'm excited to be talking to you about these things and hopefully it'll help you make changes in your everyday um, and to make you a little bit more aware of what products to avoid. So talking about the scale just quickly here, if you everybody have a look at the hair on your arm and how fine that arm hair is, right? Or the hair on your head, we're talking way smaller than this, right? So the plastics go from as fine as the plastic on your arm hair to being seen with a microscope. Um, so microplastics and nanoplastics are foreign um, substances and they can get into our body and they cannot be digested or absorbed by the body. And, and they can actually cause irritation if they're left for too long. So the plastic particles have also been found to create tumors and cancer if they're left within the body. So they are infiltrated every millimeter of our planet. They've been found buried in the Arctic Sea, in the guts of marine animals, in the stomachs of coral, in the deepest trenches, in drinking water all around the world, even in human blood. And there's estimated to be about 14 million tons of microplastics on the ocean's surface, on the seafloor, which is terrifying. This is um, right here on the right. I make these um, beach plastic keychains uh, while well, I used to it in university. And this one is made all with the microplastics that were left behind after I had done all of the crafts, um, just to give you an idea of the scale of, on some of these things. So this is what we see on Bermuda's beaches from these microplastics to nanoplastics. Um, in my dissertation, I actually did a study here on the island for I studied environmental science well, environmental geography is what I studied, um, but I did a thesis on um, microplastics in the sand. So what I did is I took um, I took aluminum pipe and I hammered it down um, to about 90 centimeters in the sand. And then I sifted it all for different plastics at different levels um, on, on various beaches around the island. And you can see here from my graphs that there was not, a, I remember there wasn't a single one that I took that didn't contain plastic. Um, and so, yeah, I haven't seen these numbers in a long time, but pulling it back up was like, wow, um, pretty scary um, to see here. So on this beach per meter squared, 2000 pieces of plastic on Whalebone Bay, Church Bay being the highest. Um, Church Bay is one of the big ones that all of the be beaches that have that that face the southwesterly um, directions, the way the prevailing wind direction, those tend to be the beaches that um, get as much plastic in them. So I've been focusing on microplastics for a while now. So here we can see in the gut of a fish, plastic. And so why this is bad. So yes, the animal isn't able to digest this plastic and it is, and it makes them feel full and they can get sick. But the real problem with it is that it acts like a sponge. Well, here, this is the size of the nanoplastics visible in the gut of plankton. They've illuminated it. And here, so the plastic actually absorbs toxins and harmful chemicals. So plastics that float in the ocean are actually like little sponges and they're going around and they're collecting chemicals that then build, build up within the bodies of the fish and the animals that ingest them. And then of course, who's at the end of the food chain eating all of that? The human being, right? Us. So our bodies are also being filled with toxins that are coming from these plastics. 
So I don't want to drag too much. I actually was going to skip this slide, but I think this part here is really important. So um, they have been, um, microplastics have been absorbing toxins um, by a factor of 10. So there's a study that who sh in this study, we showed that even very low concentrations of environmental pollutants, which are non-toxic to humans, once absorbed to plastics, result in significant increase in toxicity. This is because microplastics are a kind of magnet for environmental pollutants, concentrating them into on its surfaces, ferrying them through our digestive tract and releasing the concentrations from certain areas. So this called increasing the toxicity within our bodies. So that's terrifying. That right there is like, oh my gosh, these are things that we can't see, things that we can't really feel, and they're just accumulating within our bodies. So just right here, um, this you can see that the microplastics and it goes into the fish and then it ends up in our bodies. But this right here is a marine plastic debris. And these are the different contaminants that would stick to it. So the ones I wanted you to see were the PPDE. These are fire retardant chemicals. So if I'm a plastic manufacturer and I'm going to make um, desks for an office, I'm going to make sure those desks are a little bit more fire retardant than if they were a wooden desk. So I add this chemical to making those desks. And th that chemical, unfortunately, doesn't stay within that desk. It leaches into the environment, it leaches onto people, and that is really harmful. It, it's a major endocrine disruptor. Um, it can cause all kinds of um, reproductive issues. And so we're seeing more and more of this. So you can see this image here as well. They stick onto the pl plastics and accumulate within animals. So how do they get into our body? Well, we are getting them through our body by inhaling plastics. If you sit in a room with plastic furniture that's falling apart, you are breathing in plastics. Also bedding. So this is a new thing I didn't know. I had some polyester sheets that I liked because they had a pretty pattern on them. Um, but actually we spend half of our life sleeping in a bed and the bed, you're actually breathing in little micro fi microplastic fibers from that bedding. So trying to move away from those plastic products. You also sweat in your bed, in your plastic sheets. So next time you go and look for new bedding, go for those natural materials, um, cotton, cotton, linen. Um, yeah, those are the ones that you would look for, out for. Um, they're also absorbed through your skin. So this is huge because I've been collecting plastic my entire life off the beach. And I didn't know that when you collect that plastic, little bits of it go into your skin, but also the harmful chemicals that I just talked about, the, those toxins can also lead to your skin. So I'd like for you all to join me in wearing gloves when we collect beach plastic, because um, I just got a nice pair of gardening gloves that I will reuse, not the plastic gloves, the reusable ones. Um, and yeah, so that's just something to know. And then of course, while you're all here today, ingesting plastic through our food. So I'm gonna give you the top four things that um, you ingest plastic through. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do to reduce that plastic waste within your life. So the scary numbers are here. So some scientists, they estimate an average person may eat up to five grams of microplastics per week. That's about the weight of a credit card. Another study breaks that down to about 5,200, no, sorry, 52,000 particles annually from various food sources. So they actually reckon that these numbers are underestimated because of the amount of nanoplastics that often get missed when scientists are looking at different items. Um, something kind of scary to know that I didn't put on the slides because I'm not too sure if I was going to share it or not. But researchers who've actually looked at human poop and they found up to 20 bits of plastic per 10 grams of excreta. It's pretty, wouldn't have want to be that person doing that job, but that's pretty scary to think that that's coming. We're literally out of our bodies. Um, and they've also been found within our livers and our spleens and in the kidney tissue. We're still, scientists still aren't quite sure how these plastics are traveling through human and animal flesh. They just don't understand that yet because it's just it's such a new topic. But the first thing I want you all to stop doing is drinking tea from tea bags. So there is plastic within your tea. All studies, every study that has done this has found thousands upon thousands of microplastics. I mean, I've seen some studies say there's billions, but I, most studies are talking about thousands. I was like, I don't know about a billion. That's quite a lot. But just even 13,000 microplastics in your tea? No, thank you. This is the scale we're talking, right? They're extremely minuscule. Um, and so there's a really, really easy way to avoid that. 
is just by getting reusable tea strainers um, and buying loose leaf tea. And I'm, I'll show you that at the end. So tea is a big one that you want to avoid. Plastic water bottles. So 93% of popular water, water bottle brands are found to have high levels of micro and nanoplastics. 259 bottles from around the world contained on average 325 microplastics per liter. So that is terrifying. I also read another study that the plastic bottle, because I have some people, they I, I see them with their plastic bottle and they're like, yes, but I've been reusing this for the last two weeks. I've been using it and using it. The problem with that is that when you refill that bottle, the actual plastic container leaches into the water and it it's a, it's a great host for bacteria that's not good for you. So simple solution, do away with plastic bottled water, but also plastic water soda is, is also damaging. And something about the carbonating of the water reacts weirdly with the plastic. And they find that some sodas actually have really, really high levels of plastic within them too. So just get those cans. If you are a soda drinker, buy it out of the aluminum can and um, get a water filter. You can get the brittles. Um, if you don't like your tap water, you can get the brittle and put it in the fridge. Um, we'll talk about the afterwards. Okay. And sea salt. So this is scary because every restaurant, everywhere you go, you don't know the type of sea salt. But a 215 study said that was one kilogram of sea salt can contain more than 600 microplastics. The 90% of table salt brands sampled from around the world contain plastics, microplastics. So you and me could be ingesting up to 2,000 bits of plastic every year from salt consumption. So to limit your exposure to microplastics and salt, you can consider buying rock salt. So a study in, that study in 2018 showed that rock salt actually has the least amount of contaminants within it. Um, so rock salt, lake salt, and then sea salt being the highest, um, which is pretty crazy to think about, but it makes sense, right? So the plastics are in the ocean and then the ocean goes onto these big vats and then they dry it out and then you have the salt. So within the salt is the plastic. I mean, it's, it's, when you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, of course. So buy that rock salt, the Himalayan rock salt, um, ones like that are going to be better for you. Seafood. So we all love seafood. We love eating seafood, but unfortunately, the ones that you really want to stay away from are the bottom feeders. So you've got the mollusks, like mussels, oysters, scallops. Their job is to filter water. That's what they do. If you they 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 suck in water from one side, it goes across their gills. They have these these um, filters, kind of like their gills, and then it goes out the other side. And they are really important in keeping the water clean. Unfortunately, they are, of course, absorbing those microplastics. So they can contain up to 10.5 microplastics per gram. Crabs and shrimps and lobsters can also contain up to 8.5 microplastics per gram. Remember, we said there's 14, was it 14 million tons of plastics on the bottom of the seafloor? These are our bottom dwellers, right? The crabs, shrimps, lobster, they're eating detritus off of the seafloor. So they're processing that. And then fish, of course, fish like salmon, tuna, they can contain up to 2.6 microplastics per gram, which might actually not seem like that much, but on a long time of accumulating that, and that's just the plastic. That's not the toxins and the chemicals that are on the plastic. So it's two things that we have to consider. So yeah, the solution really is unfortunately to eat less seafood until they can figure out a way to get the plastic out of the ocean. We are, I don't know how the best way to help the sea creatures, um, but us all doing our part to reduce our plastic consumption daily will make a huge difference. And of course, microplastics have now been found in human blood. So a research study um, published um, by the Environmental International stated that the researchers, they analyzed 22 people and they found plastic particles in 80% of the people tested. Half the blood samples contained PET, plastic commonly used in packaging, bottles in packaged bottles, as well as polystyrene usually found in food packaging. So you remember when I had the seven different types, that's number one and number three, right? That's the plastic water bottle and the PVC that are both found within our blood and in the human body. And really understanding the immediate effects of this are yet to be, like we, we really just don't know. We have not had enough time. There has not been enough data. And so we're really, it's it's just something to be mindful of. I know that in Japan, there's actually a clinic that you can go to and they clean people's blood of plastic. Like that's that's their job is to clean people's blood of plastic, which is so horrific to think about. 
But um, yeah, I, guess, I mean, I'm sure some people, like if you're exposed to it, we are probably all full of it. Um, but there is hope. So there's some really cool, interesting new research that's coming out. And there's this one interesting dude. This is a bacteria. So the new study, um, so new understanding of plastic chemistry has led to many discoveries um, and there is hope among the dark, dark trash pile. So this is a plastic eating bacteria that has been found to digest plastics. This is very, very new science. They are not um, disclosing a whole lot of information on it because it, could you imagine this bacteria were to get loose and the havoc that it could wreak, right? I mean, so it would have to be very controlled landfill facility that is completely shut off from the outside world um, for something like this to really help break down the plastic. But the fact that a bacteria is able to digest it is pretty spectacular. And then my next thing, and the yesterday, there's another species that they found in Australia, but this species here is, um, now bear with me, Telestalotophis microspora. Maybe it's especially hungry for plastics. These mushrooms can th survive by eating nothing but plastic, even in the total darkness with no oxygen. So that's ideal. If you have a landfill and then you can seal it off, put the little mushrooms in there and then they can bio, they can degrade this plastic, which is really amazing. But again, it's something that we have to be careful with because us human beings love to introduce things into environments without thinking about the cause that uh, effect, right? This mushroom, you never know. It could be an alien species that all of a sudden just starts covering everything. And so really have to be mindful when we're looking at stuff like this. Um, so I think in the next few years, hopefully there'll be more um, talk about it and a little bit more, yeah, research. And then this is interesting. So um, Vinya Daravid, a material scientist and engineer professor at Northwestern University, he's leading and the development of a multiple variations of this technology. So it is a sponge that you basically put an affinity coating on it and that acts like a glue and it attracts pollutants. And this is amazing. So he's got the sponge, which is a very simple idea. And he is able to put different coatings on it and it acts and it actually attracts different um, toxins, different plastics. So an example of this is he put one, he made a version that attracts phosphates. So in ponds that are out, that have major algal blooms because there's a farm nearby that's putting too much fertilizer and that phosphate is running into the pond causing an algal bloom, which is killing the ecosystem. By putting this sponge in there, the sponge is able to attract and soak up the phosphates in the water. And then that sponge can be removed. The phosphates can be squeezed out of the sponge and reused in fertilizer. They've also found a similar one where they make that for heavy metals so they can extract heavy metals and different types of plastic, which is super exciting. So by putting these, for example, in the estuaries or in water system, waterways, soakaways, having this type of technology, again, it's extremely new science, but I think it's really exciting to see that there are, I mean, because when you think microplastic, you're like, okay, we can, we can throw our big plastic items away and that's not a problem, but to have something like engineered to actually extract the plastics that we don't see, it's exciting. But what can we all do on our daily? So you can reduce your plastic consumption. These are all of those single use plastics. Um, please just try and make an effort to reduce the plastic in general. Um, say no to products with microbeads in them. So a lot of facial scrubs or toothpaste that have those little bits in them, that's actually plastic. And when you spit it down the drain or you ingest it accidentally, it is causing harm, right? I mean, in Bermuda, every most people, it goes into our um, cesspit, pit, septic tanks or cess, cesspit, um, and it's still, it doesn't belong there, right? That plastic is then in the environment, in the earth, and the waste facility here, they do what they can, but being able to filter that tiny little plastic is going to be really, really impossible. So us as a consumer need to reduce the amount that we put that in the environment. Changes that you can make today. So... Never buy a plastic water bottle or soda. Just stop it um, unless you're like dying of thirst on a stranded boat or something. Um, use a filter to clean your tap water or your Bermuda Waterworks water. So I've um, recently invested in a similar bread up. It's actually a glass one. Um, I got it at Island Trading. They have the glass ones um, and it filters the water um, and you can have like little charcoal pods in it to clean that. And so that will help you. Um, Bermuda Waterworks water is very, very clean. Um, so you can just drink that or 
you never know the plastic bottle that it's in might also leach and we don't know that. So just making that change. And then also next time you do a purchase on bedding, make sure that it is a um, natural material because you are spending half of your life in that bed. Um, and so by reducing your amount that you sleep in a plastic bed, it would be better for you. And then alternatives to your plastic in your everyday life to improve your health. So I've just recently invested in these little bags. So this, um, they found that those plastic bags that we put our fruit and vegetable in at the grocery store, they leach plastic onto our produce. So when you put that, your broccoli in the plastic bag, and then you put the broccoli in the fridge, the plastic bag doesn't let the broccoli breathe. So it actually rots your food faster and it leaches plastic into your food because it's such a thin, cheap quality plastic. So you can buy these really cute little mesh bags. I just got some down in the, um, the zero waste store down in St. George's on the high street there. Um, I know Lindos is selling them and um, Brown and Company. So just have a look out for these types of little bags. Um, you feel very cool actually having your, and it feels cleaner. It really does. Um, and then your things last longer in your fridge. Always have reusable bags in your car. That's a no brainer wherever you're going just to have a couple of extra bags lying around. Um, and another thing I've been swapped in my kitchen, I use these Swedish cloths, which are these rags because the sponges that we use, the, those plastic sponges, they are constantly shedding plastic into the waterways and down through the drain. So buying products that are made from wood and natural materials is definitely the way to go. And tea strainers, right? So having a way to, to drink loose leaf tea with your tea strainer, it does make a bit more of a mess to clean up afterwards. But honestly, not having a microplastic cup of tea in the morning makes a huge difference. And another really great swap that I've done recently is these are the tea bags. They sell them at um, Brown and Company. I just I got one um, from there. And from Ziploc bags to these silicone bags. So silicone is actually a lot better for you than plastic. Um, silicone is durable. It doesn't leach. Um, it also, yeah, it doesn't um, harbor toxins on them. So that's really cool. And then the beeswax wrap. Um, this is a beeswax wrap that you can put on top of your thing. So um, you can actually make them yourself with fabric and the beeswax, or you can buy them. But I find that they're really great um, uh, alternative to saran wrap because, you know, we have become so used to having these single use plastic items in our household that it's difficult to change. So having these different options is great. And this um, glassware as well with the silicone lids, um, I've changed out all my plastic ones to these um, glass they are a little heavier, but knowing that my my plastic container isn't leaching into my food um, makes me feel a lot better. Um, and beauty products, would you believe it? The amount of makeup and stuff that actually has plastics in it, like the glitter and the sheen things. So trying to move away from products that are um, bad for the environment, that is really where you have to do your own research. Bermuda is slowly getting there. I know there's a store on Front Street, I think Salt and Cedar, that, that's been bringing in a lot of products that are environmentally friendly, but um, I just recently started using the shampoo bar and I, I mean, I was skeptical at first, but my hair feels beautifully clean and, and it's not any messier than it usually is. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm a full advocate for the um, shampoo bars and also my, my bathroom, I'm in my shower and I'm not fighting plastic bottles and having them fall on my head. I just have my three bars, um, my conditioner, my shampoo, and then my um, body wash. And it's just, you feel lighter and then you, it also lasts way longer, so much longer than the um, shampoo bottles that, yeah. And yeah, so that's really great. Um, I wouldn't recommend the bamboo toothbrush. I don't know if you guys have been using one, but bamboo products um, like bamboo cutlery and um, toothbrushes and things, they just don't dry in our climate. And Bermuda's um, with the amount of mildew and mold that we have all around us, that is just, yeah, I don't know, up to you. I personally, I got an electric toothbrush that I've had now for a while, which is plastic, but you got to pick your battles with this one, I tell you. Um, and then the last one is swap to a more reusable lifestyle. So these are also really cool. The loofah, I just got a, one of these. This is a vegetable that grows and it dries out into this interesting looking pod shape. And that's a great scrubby. Having your plastic water bottles, this metal cutlery, 
Um, yeah, reusable bags. We've, we've talked about these things, but really anything that you can do, like go home, have a look in your cupboards and be like, dude, are these the types of plastic items that I need in my life? Or can I make sustainable swaps, right? This, this metal lunchbox, if you've got small children, super cool way, also super easy to keep clean. Um, and yeah, open. And then, yeah, if you don't have these like random little containers that you're trying to cram into the lunchbox every day. Um, and I, a wonderful quote from one of my favorites, David Attenborough, it is one world and it's in our care for the first time in history of humanity, for the first time in 500 million years, one species has the future in the palm of its hand. Thank you, Sir David Attenborough, you legend. And the last thing that I would like to show you guys today is a video that was put together by Beyond Plastic. Beyond Plastic is the new organization that are, um, their main focus is tackling the ban of single-use plastics in Bermuda. So they're working with the community and with the government in um, trying to make sure that, um, yeah, we ban the single-use plastics and it's going to be a really hard fight. So I'm going to play that video and then I'm going to jump to the questions. So if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat and I'll address them after the video. Cool. And no. Um, no, let me just stop sharing quickly and then I'll get it to play. Sorry. Um, Aaron's in it. It's a great video. I love it. I think it's really awesome to see all of the beautiful people that live in Bermuda. We really are lucky people. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. Here we go. Ready? There are studies that are showing that plastics are having impacts on fertility rates. These plastics are leaching toxins in, into our environment. They are accumulating in the biomass or the tissues of organisms. Ocean health and human health are intimately interconnected. And if the ocean is healthy, we're healthy. Now we've looked at uh, over 250 fish and 12 different species and 40% of them had plastic in their gut. Well, in the past, single-use plastic was uh, a convenience to us. It's not a convenience anymore. It's hurting our island, hurting our ocean, and we need to stop. Every person makes a difference and even the smallest changes are important and if we make right choices based on the education and understanding that we have with our environment and how we're all intimately interconnected it does matter and it's really exciting as a consumer to have that power to impact the environment so drastically in just one purchase i think this committee uh, a campaign can really have a great effect on educating the community it encourages the public and everyone in the community to work to reduce their single-use plastic waste. Bermuda is such a beautiful place, and we all want to protect it and keep it as pristine as possible. We're going to have decades before these um, chemicals are out of our system. I think we really need to prioritize it so that we can see a future. I say no to single-use plastic because I grew up in the most beautiful place on Earth. And I want the next generation to enjoy swimming at a pristine clear water beach like I did as a kid. I say no to single use plastics for the beauty of our island. For the beauty of Bermuda, our oceans, our wildlife. We're not turtles! Why? Because I just don't like plastic. I say no to single use plastic because I just hate picking up trash. There are lots of so many other applications that are so necessary and important in our society. This thing's so frivolous. We take it, use it for a few seconds, and discard it. SNT, SUP. SNT, SUP. SNT. SUP. Say no to single use plastic. SNT, SUP. Say no to single use plastic. SNT, SUP. Say no to single use plastic. Nice. I love that video. I think it's a great way to show that our whole community can move towards a sustainable future where we reduce our single use plastics because 80% of the trash that ends up in the ocean is actually single use. So it'd be a great step for Bermuda. 
Joanne, I see you asked me a question. You said, is bamboo bedding a good option? It is. Bamboo bedding is definitely a good option. Um, yeah, it can be quite heavy, but it's definitely very soft and nice material. Um, yeah, so just looking out for those items when you're buying things and also be mindful of product products that say eco-friendly on them. Eco has become this big greenwashing thing that a lot of big companies have been using to disguise their um their products and so they'll say that something is eco-friendly um and in fact that it's eco-friendly maybe but it's not biodegradable um and so just doing your due diligence and research and if you're ever having an event or if you're buying things in bulk and just yeah um if you ever need to shoot me a message and ask you can reach out to me um i'll put my email quickly in the chat programs at buei.bm and again, my name is Hannah Horsfield, and I'd love to say thank you to everybody for joining me today. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming out. Um, thank you to BDA is love. Um, I'm excited to see what else you guys are up to this April. I'll see you at the yoga. Um, Saturday is actually my birthday on Earth Day. So I'll be cutting down some trees, but I will be missing the event that you're doing. Um, but it was wonderful to see speak to you guys today. Um, and thanks so much. Okay, I'm going to go now then. Anybody has anything else they want to say? Everybody's saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Where, Eric. Where's, that, where, where's the, the redo store in St. George's? Um, uh, I keep forgetting the name of the store, but it's right. It's right um, there by, right by Wahoo's. If you go down, um, I, I can't believe that I was going to keep the name for this presentation, but um, if you type in like St. George's Eco Store, or she's she's really cool. Um, she's like all these epic items in there. Um, I'll see if I can find it and I'll send it to you, Aaron. Cool. Awesome. Right. cool well thank you guys i appreciate you all for joining me and enjoy the rest of this beautiful well, today's not all that beautiful but for the rest of the week cool take care thank you so much Anna. bye